so you do a lot of training of law enforcement and martial artists and people who are you know interested and invested in this kind of close quarter fighting how what if you were to spitball it what percentage of people would you say in that line of work carry a fixed blade as opposed to a folder um well wow, that's hard to say um the when you look at law enforcement, the folks that I come in contact with as far as training and stuff like that, typically are kind of the exception to the rule. I mean, all law enforcement officers get some kind of defensive tactics training. Uh, typically, it's more of uh, just kind of comes along with the rest of the package as far as their their training. Uh, the ones that are really serious are the ones that seek out additional training. They're the ones that show up to my seminars. Uh, in some cases, it'll be small departments that will commission me to come out and do specialized training for them but they already are the exception to the rule. And I would say that at that point, you're talking about maybe, I don't know, one to 2% of the law enforcement market that actually seek out that additional training as far as martial arts or defensive tactics. Mm -hmm. um, when you boil that down even further and you start looking at knife carry preferences and everything, I think folders are still preferred, mostly from a convenience standpoint, but, um, for the the officers who are really serious about like using an edge weapon for weapon retention for handgun retention mm -hmm. they typically tend to lean much more to to fixed blades simply because they're easier to deploy and get into action with fewer mechanical movements in that, in that sort of high stress environment uh, exactly situation it might be hard to manipulate well when you think about it if somebody's trying to grab your your handgun you're already engaged in a gross motor skill tug of war so you're fighting over your handgun and now you're typically have your your dominant side tied up in that tug of war you're going to take your non-dominant hand and you're going to try to open a sharp folding knife right. with one hand doing complex motor skills while you're doing while you're worrying work. about this like over on the here. other side and you're trying not to get punched in the face while you're grabbing your gun it's it's a pretty dynamic situation whereas when you look at something like a fixed blade simple draw and it's it's much easier to get into action so you'll see stuff like the TDI knife. You'll see a number of other knives that have been created specifically for that um, that problem. Um, but again, as far as a number of officers who kind of embrace that, I would still say it's it's pretty much a minority. A lot of them, sadly, will carry a knife but not really have any good training to go along with it. Um, so of course, we do everything we can to try to solve that or, or fix that problem. Right. <clears throat> you, you mentioned a very small percentage of police officers actually seek this kind of training out or departments actually seek this tra training out in your experience um are they uh, motivated to seek this kind of specialized training out after something specific has happened maybe a couple of knife attacks or they're seeing an upward trend in that and and so they they look for a solution or how, how does that uh, tend to work from your angle What's interesting about it is knives, um, especially when it comes to law enforcement, just in general terms, as far as knives are concerned, um, it's really kind of a unique thing because uh, the vast majority of departments out there will authorize the carry of a knife. So they'll typically look at it as, yes, you could carry a knife. Their thought process administratively is that you're going to carry that knife because it's a tool. We want to be able to have you have the capability to cut a seatbelt if you need to, or just from a utilitarian standpoint. But once you carry that, it's also uh, a lethal weapon, potentially lethal weapon. So now what you have when you look at law enforcement training across the board, you have the continuum of force as far as law enforcement is concerned, going from verbal commands to, you know, empty hand tactics to uh, pepper spray to impact weapons like, you know, collapsible batons to tasers to firearms. Well, the knife kind of falls right in there at the same point as a firearm but it's not considered to be part of their training continuum. Hmm. So when you look at all those other tools, they have specific protocols that they've gone through. The department has done its research and they said, okay, this is our curriculum for the use of a uh, tactical baton. So they do an ad hoc program or they do an ASP program or whatever else it might be. And they embrace that particular curriculum. And along with that curriculum comes all of the solutions for legal liability. So whatever the use of force is, when you get to that point in the continuum, you know, you deploy the weapon, you use it in accordance with your training. And therefore, the the administrative side of things, the liability side will stand behind you. If suddenly the knife comes out, there's no training that goes along with that. So you're kind of 
off the charts, if you will. And what it becomes is what they call an officer survival situation. So there are documented cases where officers have used the, the old, the big radios as striking implements. They've hit people with radios. They've hit people with flashlights. And those weren't necessarily trained responses. But once the officer is literally in kind of the same thing that we would have as a self-defense situation where they're in fear for their life, they really don't have any other purpose design tools that they could bring into play and they have to improvise. That's where the knife kind of falls, falls into play. And for the, the departments, um, they really don't want to pay for another program. They really don't want to um, have to maintain another uh, credential as far as currency in, in a particular system or anything like that, where law officers have to go for annual recertification. So they have to do that for taser. They have to do it for baton. They have to do it for defensive tactics and all this other kind of stuff. They don't want one more thing. So from a practical standpoint, it kind of makes sense from a functional standpoint for the officers who kind of embrace the idea of using edge weapons as part of their defensive tactics, um, they're on their own, very much so. So it becomes something where they kind of have to look at what what they feel would work best. And again, those officers that seek out that training are already kind of the exception to the rule. Would you say, uh, in your opinion, that it might be a matter of optics that local politicians and sheriffs and other political, um, more political bodies on the law, law enforcement spectrum might find something unsavory about learning about knives because it's so close up and so brutal and kind of visceral, whereas a, 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 a firearm or a taser is a little bit more detached. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, that's that's another aspect of it. So from the pragmatic standpoint, from the administrative and cost based standpoint, from the the training recertification, all those things kind of um, weigh against the idea of using knives. But certainly if an officer was forced to use a knife, mm -hmm. that would also be under close scrutiny. And of course, the way that things are going these days, the media you know, has law enforcement under a magnifying glass. So they're going to look at anything that they can uh, manipulate to try to paint paint them in a, a less than favorable light. So certainly that part of it is also uh, very you know very valid observation. The optics are not good. <laughs>